The following program is a SUTV student production. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Salisbury University, the University System of Maryland, its regents, administration, officers, employees, or representatives. On the broadcast tonight, outrage in Baltimore. There has been unrest in the city after the death of Freddie Gray at the hands of the police, and the protests have made their way to Salisbury. We'll have more on how it's affecting this area tonight. Fire service saga. We'll bring you the latest on the negotiations between the city of Salisbury and Wacomico County and how it could affect campus and students. Tonight, we sit down live with County Council President John Cannon. And New Life. The baby bear at the Salisbury Zoo made an appearance last week, and we've got the video to prove it. That and more tonight on SUTV Evening News. Such as Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Dane it's a standard operating procedure. Good evening and welcome to SUTV Evening News. We begin tonight with some images of the aftermath of the riots that took place on Monday in Baltimore City on the night of the funeral of Freddie Gray. Gray, whose death is still under investigation, died on April 19th after being in a coma for a week. The unanswered circumstances around Freddie Gray's death have sparked protest and violence in Baltimore and again bring the nation's attention to a strain in relations between minority communities and law enforcement. Wacomico County has sent a number of sheriff's deputies as well as an armored vehicle to assist with the situation. Morgan State University has reached out to the SUPD, which is now on alert to assist if needed. And tonight there are a number of events scheduled in the city of Salisbury in response to what's going on in Baltimore. At Tuesday's campus consortium, President Dudley Eschbach invited students to talk about their feelings about a number of issues, including race relations and what can be done to improve them on a campus such as Salisbury University. She also talked about this year's legislative session and a number of other things going on at the school. For an overview of some of those issues, we sat down earlier today with the President's Deputy Chief of Staff, Ravi Sheehan. Um, on Tuesday, Dr. Eschbach held a campus consortium and she talked about um, some of the things going on in the school as well as some of the things um, that took place that have to do with the university in the past uh, legislative session. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the president earlier in the semester actually had uh, held a similar uh, consortium assembly uh, where we bring the entire uh, campus community together, that's faculty, staff, and students, really to talk about issues that are affecting the campus community. Earlier this uh, semester we talked about the budget and uh, the reason for the mid-year tuition increase. And then after the legislative session, the president wanted to brief the, the campus community on uh, the result of the legislative session, so where we ended up. What what about the legislative session? What are some yeah, things so that, was, that came out? That was effectively the cut to Salisbury University was about one million twenty-one thousand, and uh, and so that was big for us. Um, we lobbied very, very hard with the legislators to try to reduce that uh, amount, that effective cut to the University System of Maryland. Uh, so it was an interesting legislative session, financially speaking. Um, as far as our capital budget is concerned, we were able to maintain the full fifty-three million dollars that we needed to keep the academic commons on track. There were two separate attempts um, by sister institutions. I won't name them, um, that were trying to claim that some of that money should have been diverted to some of their capital projects as well. So we were very successful in maintaining that $53 million to finish the construction of the library. And our full interview with Robbie Sheehan can be found on our YouTube page. We will be sure to keep you up to date with updates on all of these issues. Over the weekend, students and members of the community came together for Relay for Life. The annual event, which hopes to raise funds and awareness for the American Cancer Society, raised over $1,000 this year. For more on the event, we go to SUTV's Allison Haley. It's a cold Friday night, but everybody's out here in full swing for Salisbury University's biggest event of the year, Relay for Life. We asked a few participants why they relay and what their favorite part of this event is. I relay for my grandmother that just passed a month ago. Just seeing all the support that um, people are bringing and uh, bringing awareness to the cause. I relay because my mom got diagnosed in December with ovarian cancer. I lost my grandma and my grandpa and my uncle to cancer, so I really like them. I really like the Just because, I mean, it like 
brings everybody together and it lights up the path with, and then walking and slowly after the mountains. I love it. It's a very positive crowd. A lot of times when you like walk through a street or a city, it's kind of just you don't get a vibe like you do here. All these people are here because they've been affected by cancer somehow or they care about it for some reason. And all these people are here because they truly care and want to make the world better, honestly. For SUTV Evening News, this is Allison Haley. And that's over $100,000 that this year's Relay bought in. Thank you for that report, Allison. We'll be back with more news after this quick break. So, are you going out tonight? I can't. My parents say I have to be home right after work. That's so gay. Totally gay. Ugh, that is so Emma and Julia. Why are you saying that's so Emma and Julia? Well, you know, when something is dumb or stupid, you say that's so Emma and Julia. Who says that? Everyone. Imagine if who you are were used as an insult. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off. You pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look. Your crush is looking at you. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> they want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. because no one. Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. And we now go to Travis Nardella with an SU sports update. Thank you, Eli. After falling in the Capital Athletic Conference Championship game to Frostburg State, the fourth-ranked Salisbury baseball team bounced back with a 2-0 week. They defeated Eastern Shore rival Washington College by a score of 5-2. Senior Brett Kalachi went eight innings in the game, allowing only two runs on five hits. Kyle Hamby closed the game out for his third save of the season. On Monday, the Seagulls traveled to Aston, Pennsylvania to face Newman University. Bobby Sanzone, Danny Breen, and Austin Barefoot led the team with two RBIs each. Ryan Dyes collected his sixth win of the season, allowing only three runs over eight innings pitched. Salisbury won by a score of eight to three in the game. They return home this Saturday for Senior Day against Staten Island. The, game, the two games are a doubleheader with the first game beginning at noon. Also losing in the CAC Championship football team, Catholic. Rachel Johnson pitched a complete game one hitter against Washington College in the first game of the doubleheader. In the second game, Rachel Johnson earned her 20th win of the season in the 11-3 victory. Against Catholic, Salisbury earned a pair of 4-0 in the first game. Johnson once again pitched a complete game one hitter. In game two, Anna Brittingham earned her ninth win of the season with the help of three RBIs from Katie Sabane. Rachel Johnson earned her 19th career CAC pitcher of the week as well as becoming the 18th pitcher in Division III history to reach the 1,000 career strikeout mark. Salisbury now awaits their fate for the NCAA Regional, which is set to begin on May 8th. The men's lacrosse team defeated New York in the CAC semifinal last Saturday by a score of 16 to four. Nathan Blondino led the team with six goals and Carson Kalama followed with three goals of his own. They face Frostburg State this Saturday at noon in the CAC championship game. And earlier this week, we caught up with Megan Wallenhorst, the women's lacrosse team's leading scorer. Um, the season's been pretty good for us. Uh, we started out a little rocky. We had some injuries uh, for some pretty important players on our team. Um, but throughout the season, we've just grown and gotten a lot better. And now at this point, we're getting those players back. And I think we're going to come back stronger than ever. Um, I think we just have to keep working um, on ourselves and just our game and getting better. Um, we know what to expect. I think with York, it's going to be a physical game. And so we just have to play tough the whole time. Um, I think we all obviously have the um, ultimate goal of winning the national championship again. Um, there's no better feeling, and I, that's my goal, <laughs> is to get all the way there. And speaking of the women's lacrosse team, on Saturday, they defeated Mary Washington by a score of 6-4 to four in their CAC semifinal matchup. Bethany Bear led the team with three goals. Mary Washington only managed six shots in the game, and Salisbury only managed eight shots in the game. They will face York this Saturday at home at 3.30 in the CAC championship game. It's set to be a very exciting weekend here in Salisbury, so make sure you head over to both Seagull Stadium and the SU Baseball Field to catch all of the action. And thanks. Back to you, Eli. Thanks, Travis. On April 29th, 1894, Ohio businessman Jacob Coxey and the Commonwealth of Christ, otherwise known as Coxey's Army, arrived in Washington, D.C. 
There was a four year long economic depression occurring and the year 1894 was the worst year of them all. Coxie and his 500 followers were marching to protest unemployment. Coxie was arrested at the state capitol for trespassing. On April 29, 1861, Maryland's House of Delegates voted against seceding from the Union during the United States Civil War. Since Maryland was a middle state, it was stuck between the Union and the Confederacy throughout the war, both physically and economically. However, after a mob attack in Baltimore, Governor Thomas Hicks called a meeting of the General Assembly where they debated whether or not they should secede to the Union. On April 30, 1948, five Washington thorn trees were planted along the front walk of Salisbury University in honor of the first five instructors of the school. The, instructor, the instructors honored were Dr. William Holloway, Salisbury's first president, Ruth Powell, Salisbury's first social director and home economics and science teacher, Ann Matthews, founder of the English department, Ida Bell Wilson, founder of the history and geography departments, and Dr. Thomas Carruthers, the supervisor of rural practice teaching, a psychology professor, and the founder of the math department. That's Today in History. And the nonprofit Salisbury Life Crisis Center has been working for years to help those dealing with a number of issues, including sexual assault. SUTV's Taylor Goble sat down with a staffer at the center to discuss what they're doing to help victims of this terrible crime. For me, raising awareness is not being afraid to talk about it. And actually, for this national campaign of um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, one of the themes is, hey, let's be activists for change. Let's join the conversation during the month of April to not be afraid to talk about what sexual violence is, what rape and sexual assault is, what sexual harassment is, um, child sexual abuse, human trafficking, to begin to talk about those difficult subjects that we don't normally talk about over coffee or over our lattes or over our frozen yogurt. We tend to not talk about those things. It's a, a silent um, crime, so to say. It's one of the most underreported crimes there is. So to raise awareness to saying, hey, we're not afraid to talk about it. It happens in our community. It happens on our campuses. It happens to our loved ones and family members. And we're not going to remain silent anymore. We're going to talk about the issues, have the hard conversations, talk about rape culture, talk about the myths and the misconceptions. And to me, that's what raising awareness means. And we'll be joined by Wacomico County Pre Council President John Cannon after this brief break. At shelters, you'll discover healthy and loving animals just waiting to become a part of your family. Why wait? You can make a difference in the life of an animal. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person and adopt your new best friend today. To find out more, visit the shelterpetproject.org. How you doing? My name's Steve. My family's lived in this neighborhood for years. Recently, things got so tight, we had to go to our local food bank for help. I lost a lot of sleep worrying about what the neighbors might think. That is until I saw them there, too. How'd I do, Steve? A little stiff. If you could have done a little what? better. What? Come on! You know, I have an Academy Award. Yeah, but not for playing me. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. We're now joined on set by Wacomico County Council President John Cannon. Thank you so much for joining Pleasure us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to start with uh, the, yesterday's meeting, the meeting on Tuesday regarding the fire service agreement. Just generally, what came out of that meeting for you? Well, we had a very productive meeting. Uh, council uh, members as well as the executive and um, the uh, chief of uh, police, Hoppus, uh, we met and reviewed what was uh, currently being, uh, what, was current, what our current options were and possibly what the options were that the uh, city of Salisbury was presenting to the council as um, um, different sources of, of funding for the city of Salisbury. Talk, talk about this so-called nuclear option. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a few weeks back, Mayor Ireton uh, spoke in, in council, at city council and county council chambers and, and made a statement that if we, we, there was no agreement between the city and the county come July 1st, 
trucks would not leave city limits. Sure. Um, and to your knowledge, has that changed? Is that still the case? Is that something that you all are concerned with? Uh, no, the county's not concerned with that. We think the, the mayor sort of got ahead of himself on that issue. Um, in the discussions yesterday, uh, I think it, it was a testament to the fact that the county is very much interested in trying to find some resolution to, to the concerns that the city of Salisbury has as far as adequate funding for the services. Uh, I don't think that the uh, mayor ever had any of the support from the, uh, the council, the city council, which is of course what he would need. I don't really think he had the support of the fire department as well. Uh, I know for a fact that you really couldn't request a fire department not to service a fire at a school across the street, which could hypothetically be a situation that could occur. So the county never, never really took that seriously. We felt, he, again, he was getting ahead of himself, and uh, we knew what our intentions were all along. He, he gave us a self-imposed 100 days without action, et cetera, but I don't think he took into consideration of what the county had on its plate during these past three months. Um, uh, again, uh, we're, we're quite willing to work with the city under any circumstances, but you know it, it has to be well thought out and well planned. Uh, I personally wish that the mayor had maybe contacted either the executive office or myself before having press releases uh, issued to that effect. We operate on the exact same floor of the uh, government office building. It would have been very nice to have a communication line open. Well, well, the mayor and the chief have made claims that they reached out to the county mm -hmm. and they received no feedback. Now, of course, that's prior to yesterday's meeting, but right. multiple times at, at both of their uh, given press conferences, they did make statements to the effect that they reached out and they didn't hear anything back. Or, or, do you have any comment on that? Is that? Well, well, I'd like to say, I mean, to begin with, I'm, I'm sort of curious as to where it seemed to have come out of nowhere, honestly. Um, this could have been brought up a year ago, it could have been brought up two, two years ago. I know that at our second council meeting in December, I did ask the executive branch of Wicomico County uh, you know, where, where we were with the fire service agreement and what we were planning to do. Uh, at that time, they were still reviewing the issues. Uh, it involves more than just the two government entities. It also involves the uh, Wicomico County Firemen's Association as well because those companies have to make a decision as to what they, you know, what is best for them. So it's uh, a much broader uh, set of circumstances than just the mayor and the, and the county having to come to some type of agreement. So at this point, whether it came from uh, Tuesday's meeting or this was in the talks already, what are some options that the county is looking at to address this issue? Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, several options. Uh, council President, uh, the city council president, Jacob Day, who couldn't attend the meeting because he was in Baltimore, he did present some uh, scenarios for us to review. Uh, as a whole, some of the options have been to go on a uh, per cost, per, uh, per service call basis uh, formula to fund the city of Salisbury. We could, of course, maintain what we're doing now, which is more of a, a flat rate that was established years ago, I think back in 2005. I'm not so sure even myself that the flat rate is the best way to go anymore. So we have to consider possibly a call basis funding. Uh, it was also uh, considered that we might do an accessible base funding. In other words, uh, the, the, it would be based on the accessible base of the property values. Um, I would like to see us maybe involving some type of uh, you know, uh, geographical services to, to actually document on a map uh, uh, the populations, uh, the type of housing maybe, and to coordinate some type of uh, uh, system where we can define clearly exactly what type of service is needed in what areas and what the proper compensation might be. We also came to the conclusion that it would be best for the city and the county to get together and go to some outside source, uh, maybe a, an accounting firm that could really take the true numbers and was familiar with firefighting procedures and EMS and uh, do some type of very true evaluation of what the costs are and what, what, you know, what the compensation measures might have to be. Do you, do you think that the system that's in place now, the agreement that's in place now, that this agreement that's years old, do you think it's working well enough? Do you think it is fair? I would want time to re-review that to really give you a definitive answer on that. But I do think, regardless, it is time that we, we at least reviewed it again. I mean, it, it was in 2005. So many years have gone by, much development has occurred, some of it right here in Salisbury University, and there's been a lot that, that has changed and it does need to be reevaluated. Is this anything that came across your desk during your first term back in 2006, 2007 as county council president? It, it never did, uh, and, and, and for the most part, a lot of these processes are dealt with executive to mayor's office or executive with the city of Salisbury, and the county council as a whole uh, is fine with that we would evaluate it through the legislative process afterwards, just as any decision the mayor might make, his city council has to approve it. 
So that's really where it was. I know that they had, uh, that the prior executive had, had uh, workings with the mayor's office in negotiations regarding uh, the airport. And as a result, there was a bit of conflict. Uh, the Salisbury, uh, Salisbury chose to pull out of that service area. And as a result, uh, Wicomico County had to bring in, had to extend Parsonsburg to cover the, the, uh, the airport so that we wouldn't lose our FAA accreditation. And that, was, that was a bit of a, that was a, a serious bit of dialogue exchange there. Uh, and it, it may have tainted the waters, I believe, at that time. So do you, do you think that this executive to executive communication has been strained by a new county executive? I mean, the previous executive was in there for eight years. Do you? Right. Do you think well, the, the issue with the airport was with the, with the prior executive. Right. I don't think there's, we're all seen as fresh, as, as new territory now. I don't think there's any uh, predisposition one way or the other. I just think that the mayor, arbit seemed to me, arbitrarily chose his 100-day uh, cycle. We're in the middle of uh, uh, <coughs> capital improvement plans, board of education issues, and, uh, and human resources, uh, uh, revamping human resources uh, uh, um, procedures. So it just wasn't very good timing at that exact moment. Realistically, can you think of any type of time frame when you think this issue will be settled? Can you think to the future a bit? And, and again, I go back, was there any type of uh, more concrete timetable laid out on t at Tuesday's meeting? There really wasn't. We'll meet again in two weeks, <laughs> if that helps, yeah. Uh, I mean, personally, I felt that this is something that we should resolve uh, by, uh, by, by next year, by July of next year. But maybe I'm being too optimistic, maybe I'm being too naive. I just would hope that uh, it would be resolved um, by the be next budget cycle. Not quite sure. I mean, again, we could we could open up this can and find out that it would take much more work than I even anticipated. But again, we have to start somewhere. And I think getting this account, uh, some accounting agency to come in and review all the procedures and the costs uh, would be a big step forward. County Executive Culver uh, promised that, you know, he, the county would be serviced. Right. No matter what. Right. Uh, of course, the question then becomes about response time. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of this university's main campus is outside of city limits. Does right. fall into Th the this studio? Th this this <laughs> studio happens to be in city limits, but the vast majority of the campus falls outside of the city limits and, and in the county. Uh, what would you say to those uh, in the university community when they ask about? Uh, added response time when it comes to the fire department? Well, uh, I, with that, I'd have to give credit also to to the surrounding uh, fire agencies, even Fruitland, Parsonsburg, Hebron. Uh, they would do more than, than they would go 120% to make sure that Salisbury University was, was covered in, in case of any type of emergency situation. And I think that's part of, uh, I mean, part of what was the county's response to this nuclear option was that the mayor insisted on a nuclear option it was to pull services well the county would pull funding and the county would would take that funding and we would enhance our services in parsonsburg and fruitland and hebron and that way it would it would compensate for uh, for for that loss in salisbury and we felt very comfortable with that and, and we discussed it with the firemen's association and they felt comfortable that they could handle that so i feel at all times the county had the best interest of all all um constituents at, at hand and, and felt 100 percent that we could handle any circumstances I, I want to I want to shift to uh, what what's going on tonight in, in Salisbury. Sure, there, there's a die-in, um, and the the mayor spoke today about how he welcomes the freedom of speech, but he's also encouraging folks to uh, stay home and, and <laughs> if, if they choose. And and you know he's encouraging peace. Obviously, they don't want to see what happened in Baltimore happen in sure. Salisbury. Um, as a county council president, uh, twofold question. Are you all doing anything um, to make sure that the relations between the police and the community aren't as strained right. as, as they seem to have been in Baltimore? And, and that, that may be when it comes to body cameras or receiving uh, equipment from the sure. U.S. military, anything like that. Yeah, know? that's a great question. I think uh, Sheriff Mike Lewis is doing everything he can to maintain a positive relationship between uh, between the minority community and the sheriff's department as a whole. I know our state's attorney, Matt Masterell, does the same thing. I have been to the meetings. I've been to the meetings with the NAACP. I attend them regularly. And I know that there have been several forums, and I give them credit. Mary Shawnee, President Shawnee does a great job in keeping the awareness um, at the level it needs to be for everybody to, to stay engaged. And uh, Mike Lewis has done a great, had made great efforts 
to go to the meetings and try to reassure everybody that they have the best interests at heart. If they can, you know, if we can work it out with body cameras at the costs that are involved, we'd 100% be on board with that. He's, he's stated that he wants to do that. The state's attorney, Matt Massarella, has stated that he thinks it would be great. The hardest part of that whole thing is that once you get the body cameras, it's not so much the cameras themselves, but the storage of that information, what you do with that, and, how you, and the expenses that are involved in storage. But we certainly would want to see that happen. And I know that uh, the sheriff has made efforts, every effort that he can, as far as one-on-one -on -one relationships through Safe Streets initiatives to try to, you know, uh, meet more one-on-one -on -one with the community and, and improve relations. We recognize that there's a strain, uh, I guess, nationwide, and that we recognize even in the Salisbury community, we can recognize the fact that there's probably the equal amount of strain, maybe to a lesser degree. But still, to any degree, we would like to eliminate that and, uh, and be a very, you know, friendly communication and, and exchange between the, the police department and any, any part of the community. G given that there, there will be a, a possibly protest tonight or, or at least some type of rally or, or, or there will be a gathering tonight right. in the city, which is in Wacomico County, are you, are you feeling safe? Are you comfortable with the decision of having some of Wacomico County, members of Wacomico County's law enforcement leaving and going to other areas? Oh, I, I, you know, as far as the mutual service agreements and things like that, I leave that up to the sheriff. I trust his judgment 100% as far as where he might go, what he might choose to do. Uh, um, I would only hope that they don't put, uh, put our guys in too much danger under any circumstances. Uh, as far as uh, tonight is concerned, um, it, it is a city issue more than a county issue. Uh, it's sometimes a double-edged sword for uh, the mayor's office or for any any elected official. You know, the, uh, the mayor of Baltimore saw that same situation. If you act too hastily, you're afraid you might incite and create more problems. If you don't do anything and, and just let it, you know, go through its process, uh, maybe that might be better. You never know at times whether to draw attention to something or to react to it in a timely manner. Uh, so it's, it's a question, it's, it's a, a call that that elected official has to make on their own. Finally, is there anything you'd like to add about your roughly first hundred days back uh, in the county council, which you all have accomplished, anything that relates to the school? Well, I think that we're doing, I think we're doing great. I think we're moving forward as we need to. I, def I certainly want to see economic development. Uh, I do appreciate the efforts that Salisbury University has done through uh, with, Sal with uh, Channel 47 on the Shark Tank and with the, um, with the Radcliffe Foundation. Um, I, I think that's the best thing they can do in trying to encourage entrepreneurship because we know that manufacturing isn't the only way to progress and, and to, to produce. We want to see entrepreneurship uh, uh, enhanced as well. And uh, the county council, the county, Wakama County is a huge supporter and we endorse that 100%. I'm glad to see it and I'll be here when, when they do it. All right, thank you so much. Great, thank, thank you very much. Here. Appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. And members of the community were excited last week when they got to see their first glimpse of the new baby bear at the Salisbury Zoo via Bear Cam. We leave you with that this week and hope to see you next. For everyone here at SUTV, thank you for joining us and good night.